So what I'm going to do is really try to you know, hover at a higher altitude than, than a lot of traditional science talks that may come through this, this auditorium and really talk about the overarching challenges of trying to turn scientific innovations, discoveries, and technology into things. Really, if we think that the, the, the goal of the sort of unifying goal of everything we're doing is really to turn science into, into things that are going to matter for families, there are many ways to, to do that. And what I'd like to do is leverage, you know, take advantage of a, you know, the unique experiences that I've had along my own journey, having been a drug hunter in the pharmaceutical industry, having been a funder of research at Autism Speaks, having been a venture philanthropist looking at start, you know, helping companies get started. I've, I've looked at this problem from a variety of different perspectives in this same large research ecosystem that we all work in. And what I'd like to do in the talk is, is really try to focus down on a, on a few key points and talk about what I think are some of the, from a strategic point of view, some of the key obstacles that stand in our way uh, in, in terms of moving the uh, science forward in the therapeutics area. I'd like to start off first by a few organizing principles just to make sure we're kind of talking on you know, uh, the same language and oriented to the same construct, if you will. And what I'd like to do is use the, 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 um, the current landscape of clinical trial activity as a, as a lens through which we can understand the trends and directions of therapeutics uh, development today rather than just focusing on what's been published. Uh, we'll talk about heterogeneity and how it really stands in the way of, of progress and, and then uh, wrap up with some what I think are some game changers in the new target uh, discovery area. But let's start with some organizing principles. Uh, and you know, I've had the, 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 the real fortune of, in my past roles, talking to all sorts of stakeholders in this, this shared problem. Uh, and it doesn't matter if I'm talking with parents or I'm talking with senators, I'm talking with executives at pharmaceutical industry, you know, pharmaceutical companies, or I'm talking to researchers like the postdocs I met with at lunch who are just getting their career started in this guild of science. I always like to begin with making sure we understand what this translational research continuum that extends from the proverbial bench to the bedside really is all about. And it really is just a value chain. And in it, and it, and, and its most simple form, it progresses through a sequence of, of steps that really begin with the creation of knowledge ultimately reducing that knowledge, the most promising bits of that knowledge to practice in the form of guidelines or products and making sure that these make it to families, that they're disseminated properly and then take this through a constant iterative state of improvement. In the world of medicines development, which we'll be talking a lot about today, there's a canonical construct that many of you might already be familiar that takes that value chain and lays it out into these sort of classic steps of, of uh, translation that begin with preclinical discovery and advancing experimental agents into different phases of, of drug development that ultimately build value into those molecules and the value that's built into them is the knowledge and how they get used. And I bring this up because this value chain is really uh, driven not by a single entity, but uh, a sequence of different partners, all driven by different motivations, different incentives, different sources of, of money. And, and, and ultimately, we can track the progress of science as it moves from the, the origins of innovation in, in academia through the processes of development, ultimately, to to the community, to patients, by using a variety of different metrics, you know, to the, the, knowledge, the, in, the engine of knowledge creation, progress may be measured in the number of publications coming out. It could be the, the number of grants funded, the number of genes discovered in the next phase. It could be the number of patents that have been filed, the amount of intellectual property that's been created, the number of new companies that have been started. It could be the number of new clinical trials that have started. There's all surrogate measures that allow us to measure the progress of science along this value chain. 
And each of you who works along this value chain probably looks at this and says, I, I can relate to that. That's where I work. Some of you are going to work across this value chain at different points in your life. But the good news here is that this value chain is humming. If we just look at some of these measures in the autism space, if you look at the change in publications in autism just over the last 20, 30 years, it's incredible what's happened. Right here, I'm just showing the number of publications that have changed during this time, the number of patent applications that have been filed and approved, the number of clinical trials that have begun. What you're seeing here is an evolution that has happened very rapidly, and the, 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 the bottom line is that autism has been really pulled from the backwaters of medical research and placed to the forefront of science today. And that engine of knowledge creation is reaching a point where I believe we are at an inflection point where we really have the ability to start moving this forward down the value chain. And we already see activity uh, happening all over that place. So what I'd like to do today is focus on this part of the value chain as a lens to tell us what's coming. How do we turn this knowledge into therapeutic opportunities, opportunities to improve outcomes through a variety of different modalities? We're going to spend most of the time talking mostly about medicines, but we'll, we'll touch on some others. But we can learn a lot about where we're headed and where the opportunities are. And I think you'll be both hopeful and have greater clarity of what needs to get done in order to ensure that this moves forward faster. In industry, we would always start with what's the end game? What's the product going to look like? What's the label on that medicine? If the parents in the audience, how many parents are in the audience today? So if I'm at Pfizer and I said I could give you one medicine today that would address a specific reality about your child's journey with autism, what would it be? You don't have to answer it. Trust me, I'm not putting you on the spot. <laughs> but there are a lot of, if I asked clinicians, if I asked researchers, there would be a great diversity of answers because everybody has different needs. But when you're trying to align an entire field's efforts to deliver on that end game, you need to understand what it is first. So we've, in the, I think the last few years, really have a much greater clarity of what those clinical targets look like. And they're a lot more complicated than we thought. They're not just the core dyad of features that the DSM-5 tells us are the cardinal hallmark features of autism dating back to Cantor. We know that autism is far more complicated. In reality, there's a whole constellation of associated comorbid psychiatric and neurological symptoms that are not unique to autism but is just important in defining the clinical journey of individuals with autism as the core features are themselves, and maybe even contribute to that. Moreover, there are a, a variety of peripheral symptoms that are also prevalent in this population. We can agree that autism is likely a disorder of brain development, but it's a whole body disorder when it comes to thinking about treatment. And each one of these could represent a bona fide target for therapeutics development. If you could pick off and address anxiety in this population, that could have a huge benefit for individuals. You don't have to just take on the core symptoms. There's also the omnipresence of intellectual disability in this community. It's even further more complicated if you think about everything else that contributes to the heterogeneity. It's not just cliche when you hear you know, the, the, the old adage of, from a parent's point of view, if you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. Science has borne this true over and over again. And in reality, beyond just the, the prevalence, the severity, and the diversity of these symptoms, there's added complexity brought on by gender, by in history of environmental exposures, by genotype. All of this has made autism a pretty tricky area to work in. But when we think about therapeutics development, bottom line here is we're not thinking about one thing. It could be any of these things. 
And these are areas that drug companies have worked in for years, have developed medicines for sleep, for seizure, for GI issues. All of these could be brought and leveraged into this autism story. They're not. They will. But you have to agree that these are targets, and you have to pave a way that enables the science to flow forward along that value chain to deliver on them. In reality, though, that really isn't the end game. That is the end game maybe for the development of therapeutics, but the end game is really about outcomes. We don't want drugs just to treat anxiety and social deficits. We want the overall care of the individual to improve these things. These are what transform life. And FDA is becoming increasingly more sophisticated in how they expect those of us who are attempting to move therapeutic innovation forward to, yes, drive it to approval based on the, the ability of a therapeutic to change a symptom, but they also want to understand how this is tied to outcome. So this combination of perspective is really what the end game is. Whether or not you're running a gel in a lab here, you're meeting with a, a, a patient in, in the clinic over here, we're all working towards this end game. And there are many different ways we can do this. Yes, the, the standard of care is, has long been behavioral interventions, uh, but in reality, there are many other modalities that can isolate these symptom areas or treat multiple areas that are going to be uh, part of the story moving forward. Treatment of autism will be multimodal. The sooner we can wrap our heads around how we move innovation forward in that construct, in that context, the sooner we'll get to that future that we all want to be, but there are medicines that can be used, there are technologies, therapeutic games, medical devices, there are medical foods, personalized nutrition, and there's a whole range of alternative therapeutics that you'd never thought of. Each of these are shots on this goal. You know, one of the real things I, I, I enjoyed leaving industry and working for Autism Speaks is I finally sort of emancipated from this myopic view of the world as only being solved through a small molecule drug. It's going to be helped by that, but how we can address this through other modalities has been really where I've spent the last six years of my life. But how we bring an integration between these is a real challenge because there's a lot of Communities are sort of set in their ways around these. But there are differences between these that we have to recognize. The potency of these might differ. Um, the, the late, the, how long it takes for these to work may ultimately differ. Certainly the cost of them, access to them in the community. All of these are very real differences that play into how we do this. But there are going to be a lot of similarities too. How we measure outcome. Doesn't matter if you've got a therapeutic game or a drug, you're, how you measure the movement on that symptom should be the same. So we benefit from work in this area. Absolutely, the requirement for evidence is not negotiable. And the plural of anecdote is not data. So how do we really move this story forward recognizing some of these similarities? We have some real leverage available to us as a, as a field. And ultimately, it'll come down to clinical trials as that engine of evidence creation, regardless of the modality. And, and that's where we're gonna be spending some time. Just a real thought, you know, uh, maybe it's an obvious note, when it comes to the therapeutic modality of medicines, there are only two approved medicines in this, this space. It's the Risperdal and Abilify, they address this cluster of symptoms that many of you are already familiar with that we call irritability. But let's not kid ourselves. These drugs were not advanced to where they are because there was a, a large preclinical research operation at Janssen and BMS. These were moved forward largely on the proof of concept delivered by the RUP network, an NIH-sponsored effort, and maybe nothing more than a life cycle management exercise for these companies who are looking to extend their patents. Do they create value for families? Yes. Do they have the same warts, 
side effects, weight gain, other things, they've plagued their use in other uh, um, populations, certainly. But this is it. The end game, though, is what's behind these two molecules. This is a snapshot from the label. Drug companies don't make their money off of the actual substance they give. It's the information that's contained in that label, the knowledge. And this is what this value chain is all about, is creating that knowledge. Despite the fact that we only have two approvals, there is a whole, whole pharmacopoeia of psychotropic medications that are being used in this population. I don't need to tell people in this room, they're very familiar with this. You know, there are cl very familiar classes of agents that in many ways target some of the symptoms that we've already talked about. They're very familiar classes, though the evidence on a lot of these is largely anecdotal, not, strong, not supported the way we would like to from large clinical trials, yet they are still working. What, we're, what we don't have in this, psych, in this off label use of medicines are, are medicines that address the core symptoms. I refute, I'm coining the term autoleptic uh, for, for the fact we don't have a word to call this class of agents that we are about to make as a field that address these core symptoms. So where are things gonna come from? What's next? beyond what we've already showed you in the therapeutic, the uh, um, medicines area. What I'd like to do now is just double click down on what we can see through the available data on ongoing clinical trials. Some of it is a little outdated, but it helps us to really inventory, almost diagnose where we're at as a field. And I, this was just a comment to make sure we understand that, that cl the clinical trials as a window helps us appreciate um, the direction of where, where science is going. And you know, the in clinical trials are just as valuable uh, to the improvement of outcome measures and other tools needed to move forward as they are uh, building evidence behind, uh, behind specific agents. If we look at the 716 so clinical trials currently registered in the government's database, clinicaltrials.gov, if you've not sort of wandered through that, I'd encourage you to do so. It's a very interesting source of information. It tells you more about where things are going than it tells you what has happened. A lot of the trials are completed and old, so you have to uh, bear in mind. But if we take a snapshot of the clinical trial activity in the space and sort of map them based on modality, Good news is here is there, there is an increase in investigation of new therapeutics. Medicines make up a large majority of them, but we see a lot of important trends uh, in, in other areas as well. Biomarkers, which we'll talk about a little bit more, not necessarily therapeutics, but they require clinical trials to help build evidence around them are also on the rise. And why are there spikes so prominent in this, this uh, um, graph, and that has to do with how the funding landscape changes and the impact of approvals in the space on sponsor-related research. So, man, there's nothing more incentivizing for the medicines development community to get off the sidelines and get active than to see another company get an approval in a therapeutic area they're not in which is why I, a little bit later I'll tell you why two clinical trials currently in motion right now are strategically critical for this, this story. But we had the stimulus funding and the first authorization of the Combating Autism Act that helped also provide the capital to move this forward. A Couple of just top line points. When you really get into the details of all of these clinical trials, which I will not drag you through, there are some common themes that are somewhat disappointing. The, the, the general power of the studies, the number of subjects enrolled in these studies, which gives you the level of st statistical confidence that you've actually asked a question and the result is meaningful and you can act on it, is very low. It's very disappointing, to be honest. The trial designs are, are really not the gold standard that we would, would like to see. So what's happened is there's been a lot of noise created through these trials. It's hard to, it's really hard for the media to sort through this. I can't imagine how difficult it is for parents to sort through what is real and what's not based on the reporting. But we're gonna to try to help you get through a little bit of that today. 
And I just want to start with what's happening in the phase two area. This is what we would call the proof of concept phase. And drugs that have entered this phase have usually you know, already shown that they're safe and we understand how they should be dosed in individuals. A lot of these drugs are being looked at because they've already been on the market, you know, and so there's a lot already known. Uh, and this gives you a snapshot of, of trials that are currently underway or have just wrapped up. We haven't seen the results. Some of them are, 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 have been published, but this is, this is it. And we're talking at least several years between a, pro, a positive proof of concept here and actually filing for an approval from FDA. But there's some things I want to point out here, a couple of things. First, Things are really encouraging because we're seeing more agents that are trying to address the social domain, that social target, getting into the core symptoms. Five years ago, that wasn't true. A few, but that, that is a very encouraging trend. There are a diversity of symptoms you see in play. There are agents that are going after sleep. I'm surprised that there are not more, and Rondi and I were talking about this, I'm surprised there are not more agents going after anxiety. Drug companies spent years developing all sorts of anxiolytics, but they haven't been pulled out and redirected. And that's something I've been on a mission to do for, for, for many years now. There are only two what we call NCEs. An NCE is a new chemical entity to the FDA. That means it's never been approved for anything else. Brand new molecule. It's a, a surrogate measure of innovation coming into the clinical trials world. And though this uh, vasopressin 1A, 1A, 1A antagonist from Roche and this neuron compound, is, that's it. The rest of these are off, uh, drugs that have already been out on the market. That's not bad, but it's just a comment on the state of the preclinical research work ahead of this. But what's encouraging is there's power behind these studies. It, the studies are getting larger, they're getting better controlled. Uh, these two studies down here are more, uh, so Simon's Foundation have picked up the old seaside compound, or baclofen, and may very well be doing some work with that. And this AstraZeneca compound is really being more looked at for uh, uh, biomarkers. There are two studies here that I think are the game changers in this slide. If you want to, you know, if you're into sports and you think, what are the most important games coming, what are the most, most important teams? These are the most important trials, from my perspective, happening in the autism space today. And there are a couple of reasons. There, the RG7314 is a molecule that is an NCE. It's one of the few new molecules that have entered into any psychiatric drug development across therapeutic areas. And that's addressing a core symptom, social, do social domain, as well as the oxytocin study. These are both large trials. One's being run by Roche. The other is run, being run, led by Lynn Sickich and her SOARS B uh, network. These will read out later this year, early next year. If either one of these produce a positive signal, it will fundamentally change the landscape of enthusiasm from investment you know, whether or not you're venture capitalists, investment banks that own large, large companies, all the way to funders who work in this area. If they read out negative, it, it, it has the potential to set things back if not properly managed. But these, if they're positive signals, it really teaches that this is possible. No one's ever got into the core domain. The oxytocin story has been around for, for some time now. But these are the two trials to really watch out for. In phase three, which is really a phase where, you know, we already know that these are work, should work based on prior data. These are actually now studies that are pivotal, trying to replicate those findings, expand them out, and meet requirements by FDA. And there are really only three uh, molecules that have made it this far. Memantine is probably not moving forward. Uh, but uh, this is a pretty anemic pipeline right now. Um, and this has to change, and it should, because we, the maturity of the science is, is at a great level. Now we can start envisioning targets. I've mentioned this already, and this is, is important to reiterate. I, I place a lot of 
emphasis on these two studies. But one of the things that has really challenged us as a field in the clinical trials areas is a lot of studies that are haven't been powered or designed well enough to provide a meaningful answer, yet media picks it up and talks about it as if it's the next best thing, the next thing that's come out, best thing. And this is creating a lot of, um, let's say, really creating challenges for us as a field, and this has to be taken on. And replication is, has been really few and far between from, with some of the more uh, uh, compelling stories out there. So if we talk about key challenges in this process of con conducting clinical trials and moving forward, one of the key challenges that we have starting off is really the measurement of outcome and the availability of valid outcome measures. What you're not seeing here is the, the mapping of these to different clinical targets. Each one of these clinical targets needs a way for us to, to objectively measure whether or not a therapeutic agent, doesn't matter if it's a behavioral intervention, a, a drug, or a, a technology, is actually changing or having an effect on that symptom in a way that demonstrates uh, with a degree of statistical confidence to FDA that there's something real there. And without those, it doesn't matter how innovative the drug is moving forward, it's dead in the water, it will not move forward. And right now, the state of outcome measure development in this space is really quite thin. And that has to do with the fact we're not as active in the clinical trial, uh, have not been as active in the clinical trial domain area as we, we need to. But this is one of the key areas of, of unmet need in moving this story forward. Clinical heterogeneity, which we'll talk about in a second, is, is the other area. And in ensuring that trial designs start to evolve to embrace what many of us already know will be the future, to embrace this multimodal nature of using treatments is critical. We're just not, I think, at a place where we have trial designs that allow us to build the evidence base of things working synergistically with one another, and that needs to change. So beyond medicines, if you look into that, that clinical trials uh, uh, story, you'll see a lot of other modalities in play. Some of them deal with technologies, some are foods, some are plays on the fever hypothesis, like fecal transplants. And we, we can't go through all of them. I'm just going to touch on a couple that I think uh, are worth watching. Certainly medical devices are an intriguing area. They're, they're less invasive. Transcranial magnetic stimulations already been approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder. Actually, a portable version of this has been recently approved for migraine. Uh, there have been a, a number of studies already done in this area. You'll hear probably from John Elder Robinson, who's a speaker later in this series, talk about his own anecdotal experience with TMS. But this is an exciting area, and, and, and it's worth watching. There are a number of trials currently underway or completing out that, that are looking at transcranial at TMS uh, in autism. Uh, just like you see with a lot of technologies, not only can these be vehicles for delivering therapeutic effects, they may also be very, very valuable biomarkers themselves. And a biomarker is really simply anything you can measure physiologically in an individual that tells you you've had some sort of biological effect. It doesn't mean it has to be therapeutically relevant, but in this case, it can tell you whether or not brain function has changed. And differences between performance on these biomarkers can actually help us begin to address the heterogeneity in the autism population. There are a number of challenges that face really a lot of different modalities. A lot of it has to do with the standardization of protocols and, and the use of gold standard uh, clinical trial designs. But across the field, we are really struggling to disrupt both the culture and the legal and ethical frameworks around data sharing. We're entering into a period where we're going to see unprecedented collection of data from patients. Whether or not it's through genomics or whether or not it's through new digital interfaces with the population like Facebook, it doesn't matter. There is going to be a lot of data collected and this is going to be used to better understand autism. Um, unless we can overcome the constraints created legally and ethically, whether or not that's all the way down to rethinking how HIPAA is authored, 
These have to be disrupted in order for us to fulfill the translational promises of this big data revolution. And this begins with simple sharing of data in clinical trials like this. Julie and I were just talking about this earlier. I, I'm fascinated by this area. When, when uh, I started at Autism Speaks, one of the first things we did as we thought about diversifying our approaches to funding science was we recognized that we, we had to move beyond just funding academic researchers, which would never stop, but we needed to find a way to support entrepreneurs and small companies, because that innovation is moving down that chain, and there are valleys of death that hit the funding and other parts of that as well. And we started a venture arm of the foundation, Delcia, and one of the first investments we made was in a company called Achille Labs, and they were developing a therapeutic game. What they were able to do was gamify a cognitive interference task, which is known in other settings to improve function. And they had an eye towards using this gamified task, this therapeutic game, to deliver th efficacy. They were written up in the Wall Street Journal. They got all this press because they were moving it forward for ADHD. And what caught my eye was that they, they were going to take this down the same regulatory path, use the same outcome measures, the same trial designs that Stratera and other uh, drugs that had been used in ADHD did. And we actually funded some work for them to do a trial in autism, recognizing that attention deficit hyperactivity is an issue in, in autism as well. So, what I like about this is it really shows us uh, there, there's no shortage of creativity that can be brought to actually delivering therapeutic effects. And just like uh, uh, TMS, these games may not pay out in terms of therapeutics, but they still actually may be very valuable as biomarkers. Performance on games can help us reveal underlying differences in cognitive function between individuals. Compliance is much higher with these games, trust me, than a lot of things we ask subjects to do. I actually went to a really fascinating conference called ESCONS, which actually brought like game programmers from EA Games to sit down alongside cognitive neuroscientists to ask in this convergence of these two disciplines, is there something we can move forward? I think when you think about therapeutic innovation, even beyond autism, this is where it's happening. Some of the biggest problems in, in autism and other therapeutic areas are going to be solved as engineering problems, not just as biology problems. And, and so this is both an exciting reality that we face and, and a somewhat intimidating reality. There are some questions about how regulatory paths would work here, you know, and dosing and reimbursement, but these are all problems that have been solved before in other areas. I didn't double click too far down into the, what I say, the alternative therapy area, because there's a lot of really fascinating work being done. Sometimes it's buried beneath small trials and hard to get up. My own personal mantra as a, as a scientist is, be agnostic about where ideas can come from, just religious about data. So if you can show me the data that proves that something works and it's safe, let's go for it. I don't care how wacky it might seem. But some of the, the commonly you know, marketed products in this community, which I think have taken advantage of a, an unfortunate combination of desperation, as parents here I'm sure can appreciate, the, the, the failure of us as a community to deliver enough options out there, which is what we work every day to do, and have started to market products that are not only uh, or likely under, well, there's no evidence that they're working, they may actually be unsafe. And FDA has started to crack down on these, and these are examples of products that the FDA has actually issued warnings about. Chelation therapies, even hyperbaric oxygen therapy, these are, have the risk-benefit equation here does not make sense from a consumer protection point of view, and that's really what the FDA is set up to do. Let's deal with heterogeneity. Because this is, this is the biggest challenge we face as a community, trying to move ideas forward. I think we can all agree right now that any notion that there's a unitary concept of a single autism is ignoring the wealth of data that researchers in this room and elsewhere have already generated. 
In reality, we're talking about an entire ontology of autisms that are going to be, de be defined by differences in all the variables that we talked about earlier in the, in the talk. And until we can reduce the complexity of that heterogeneity, which equals variability, we are going to be buried in failure in clinical trials. The, the expectation that, that an individuals with idiopathic autism are all gonna respond similarly to the same treatment is just not based in reality. But the only thing we can do to move that forward is to, okay, explain the complexity, reduce that complexity, begin breaking this community into autisms. It doesn't mean you have to uh, relinquish the identity of autism, it just means biologically and operationally we need to move this forward. And we can't expect treatments to work unless we do this. So this strategically is the most pressing area of research there is in this field, from my point of view. And the real innovations are co will come once this is reduced. And, and really, biomarkers have emerged to be that lens that we can begin to see the differences, whether or not it's differences in genotype or differences in an enterotype, your microbiome, it doesn't really matter. There are many different ways you can create a, a, uh, an ontology of autisms. And right now, there are a number of large-scale projects getting off the ground. The Simons Foundation Spark Project, our missing program at autism, which is sequencing 10,000 individuals with autism and their families, whole genome sequencing, every letter of code. And doing this at scale where we are really building databases of population scale data. And it really will be through the mining of that data that we begin to reveal what we're after. How is that population really divided up? What is that ontology of the autism really look like? And this is not a trivial exercise. The you know, biomarkers are being you know, e explored and, and discovered you know, all the time, being validated maybe a little bit slower than we'd like, but it's, this effort is underway. But it's not, it's not trivial, and there are some real challenges we face just in the management of that data. To give you an example, this missing project that I mentioned, where whole genome sequencing 10,000 individuals with autism. Every letter of three billion letters of code in each individual produces a petabyte scale data set. Put that in perspective, that's equivalent to watching a high definition TV show streaming on your laptop continuously for 13 and a half years. And that's just the genomic layer of this data. Yeah, it's the most intensive, but the, not only the, the, the capacity needed to store that data, but the compute horsepower needed to be mounted onto that to ask questions of it have rapidly outstripped what most academic institutions have. When we started this project, I was talking to NASA administrators who had, you know, the only project we could find that was similar to this was their low earth orbiting satellite program. But Google came along and we've been working with Google and, and Google has taken on this project. But this reinforces what I just said a moment ago. The, the future of the biology is going to channel through the ability to, to mount technology against this. And it's gonna forge relationships between industries that weren't there before to ensure success. And it's likely that the classification of autisms, once data is available, may be solved through machine learning or connections and patterns in the data understood through someone who knows nothing about autism. They know it as a code. It's not impossible to think about that, but that's the direction we're, ha we're heading. Just imagine if you had a social media layer to this. Just imagine if every one of the individuals in missing were also on face, uh, an autism Facebook, and they were talking about their journey continuously. And over time, you would see conversations cluster, three conversations over here clustering around a unique sleep issue or a GI issue. These people don't know they're talking about the same thing, 
and they may not realize when you look further in, they all have mutations in a pathway that we would have never connected together unless they would have shared that data. So not only is data moving forward in this way, the, the involvement of the patient community in the care circles around them is changing from passive to a more active role. And I don't think it's unlikely. I mean, there are companies like 23andMe, patients like me that are already doing this. Exciting times. But unless we can get to this ontology, we reduce this complexity of autism, it's gonna be very difficult for us to actually move even the mo most compelling of, of new therapeutic ideas forward. A couple of game changers. Uh, you've heard a lot about uh, pluripotent stem cells. I, you know, hard not to acknowledge this. For those of you who don't know what this is, we now have the ability to actually just take cells from an individual, maybe they're from your hair follicle, maybe they're a, a, a punch from your muscle, put them into culture and actually reprogram them back to a Im almost embryonic state where they, they have the potential to become any cell in the body in vitro if you wanted to. Why is that important? Well, you, through differentiation, you could, you could actually create every cell type that's in the brain and study that individual's biology at, an, at, a, at a fundamental biology level. Is this autism? No. But if you're in the process of trying to understand what's different between people, and you'd like the ability to test some ideas, maybe even drugs, without having to involve them, this is opening up some very interesting possibilities. Individualized clinical trials, if you will. Using these, you, these, these um, differentiated cultures, you could do toxicity screening that's personalized, if you're trying to validate a new target, understand, oh, these 10 individuals have this new mutation that we know nothing about, we could get stem cells from them and start understanding them without having to take them through invasive procedures. And the, really the potential to build whole libraries of these stem cells to screen experimental agents is very real. But it is also through this that the promises of precision medicine may ultimately be realized. In cancer, this is already being done broadly. They're even doing organoids where they can take circulating tumor cells in individuals and actually grow little tumor organoids in there. And that can be very valuable in knowing before taking someone through a chemotherapy whether or not they have a high probability of responding to that therapy. So this is a really exciting area. It's still immature in my view, but it's something you definitely need to take, um, keep tracking, and it's, it's definitely something that will be an important tool in that battle against heterogeneity. Also could be very powerful in understanding environmental exposures as well. Just imagine this is what the future is gonna look like. Within a few years, there will be repositories, just like there were repositories that had collected DNA and other biomaterials and made them available to the research community. Teams are going to go out and begin developing repositories of iPS cells from as many different genotypes, as many different defined individuals as they can get. And hopefully this will become accessible to researchers all over. Certainly the data that's generated from there needs to be accessible to everyone. But it takes us back to some of really some of the ethical and legal challenges of sharing <laughs> information like that. If we are really going to move this story forward, we are going to have to evolve our sort of ethical frameworks around the sharing and access to data. Many of the consents that we used in Agree a decade ago didn't contemplate what we're doing with uh, genome sequencing today. I mean, right now with whole genome sequencing, we can, it, you know, what took the Human Genome Project over a decade, $3 billion, more human man hours than it took to put a man on the moon to sequence that first human genome, we can do for $1,000 in one day work. And that generation of that data is incredible. But when people were signing and consenting to be part of that, they didn't understand that that's where we were going, but we're bound by that. So, this is gonna be a very interesting time in how we manage away from the science the things that enable it moving forward. 
So I already talked about the, the key you know, challenges around this. Not, not really much to add here other than there is going to be an ongoing discussion about that balance between the exploitation of data for for-profit use and non-profit use. Culturally, there's a lot of pushback on that, but are these, should these resources be openly available to everyone? Coordination, coordination, coordination is, is critical. You know, I sit on the IAC and I still struggle to see our coordination as a field. It's not IAC's you know, problem at all, but it's, it should be the mandate of bodies like that, patient groups especially, to really drive the field into these channels that are moving down towards the, these clinical targets and taking on these, these battles around you know, legal and ethical frameworks, et cetera. One of the top questions I would always get when I was working in industry as I was making the pitch upwards in these organizations, we should take on autism. Oh, you're crazy. We work in depression, we work in Alzheimer's, we work in schizophrenia. You know, why? Where are the targets going to come from? This is where I think autism has a unique handle. Uh, the genomics of this space are really paying out in a big way. They are offering etiological insights, not for all of autism, but real handles on the biology. But once you have targets that you think about, how you de-risk them are absolutely critical. And the good news here is we have a, we have a, a, an, a very you know, inspiring array of, of assays that can be used in, in animals to help us model fundamental aspects of autism. Animals will never have autism. To actually understand and, and validate new targets as they come forward. And there's no shortage of creativity on what species you can use. M many animals are social. These show you a variety of different species that are being used and could be used. There are the workhorses of, of preclinical research being done here, rats and mice, and with CRISPR technology, you can genetically engineer these with all sorts of human risk alleles. But now they're even making marmosets that carry human gene risk alleles. And you can even look at fundamental biology down phyla into fruit flies and worms. There's really no shortage of opportunities for us to leverage this, and that's gonna add a lot of value. One of the real game changers I have to point out, because it's happening right here in your backyard. And this is the, the Preclinical Autism Consortium for Therapeutics, PACT, as, as, as Jackie has called it. And it is, it is really a response to several things that drug hunters have struggled with for years. One of the biggest ones is standardization of preclinical screening of compounds and the difficulty of uh, replicating findings that have been published in the literature. There have been many, many studies that have been published in this area about the difficulty of reproducing data. Uh, it's real, I can tell you, the opportunity cost for companies working in this area are incredible. But what has been created here is a, a, a preclinical screening battery of animal models and associated assays that allow companies, researchers, anyone in the field who do not have those capabilities to, to screen experimental agents aimed for the clinic to help de-risk them in a standardized way, running many clinical trials, if you will, for autism. And they are in the leaders of this uh, consortium, well, Jackie's the, the really the PI here, but she's got her co-PIs here, and, a, and an amazing advisory uh, that helps, helps drive this. This is really a, a game changer. There are whole companies that are set up to do this in other therapeutic areas, psychogenics and others that do this not nearly as efficiently as, as Jackie and her colleagues, but fundamental setup here is they've built a paradigm where you can take an agent, screen it in multiple models of a particular genotype known to have high risk for autism in two different species, rat and mice, and see how the effects of that molecule differ between them. They have assays that can look at the biology and, and behavioral phenotypes similar to what is observed in, in autism. 
most drug companies right now are exiting their research investment, which means even if they wanted to get into autism, which most of them do, they don't have the researchers to actually do the work. Many companies are shifting from a model we were talking about with the postdocs this afternoon, a model of research and development. We will research ideas, bring molecules forward, and then develop them all at once to an S and D model. We'll search for it and find it outside and then bring it in in development. And what that's done is it's put emphasis on the community of entrepreneurs and small companies and even large companies out there who want to do this to do their own screening. Most of them don't have them, but they can turn to PAC to do that. That's an amazing strategic resource for the field. And it puts the mind institute square in the center of a very important unfolding story in therapeutics development. I'm actually looking forward to seeing the first molecules come through. But it's a standardized approach that isn't available and, and that's just sort of desperately needed. It's already proven to work, pre, you know, before we, it was even set up, we had been working with Jackie. She mentioned this molecule, which was developed by a team I led at, at, at uh, Wyeth and then Pfizer and, and it produced a very nice uh, publication in science, translational medicine. One last slide here, another game changer, if you will, to um, point out. Investigators and institutions are becoming increasingly reliant, companies increasingly reliant on what we call pre-competitive research consortia, that is uh, agreements between researchers to work ahead of the intellectual property or any opportunity to benefit financially to advance the science. And when I was at Pfizer, we wrote a concept paper for a research uh, program, a consortium that has now become what is known as EU Ames, which it's a five-year, $58 million research program, it's the largest research program in autism. And it brings together many of the, the world's largest drug companies alongside many research centers of excellence in Europe to work on a variety of work packages, all sharing in common, driving this story forward. They've built the largest clinical trials network in the world throughout Europe. And they continue to drive innovation on the animal models work and biomarkers. Autism Speaks was part of that. After I left Pfizer, we continued to work with them, adding some of our own connections with data management. But this is a very interesting pro program coming into its fifth year. It has generated a body of very important publications. These types of consortia will continue to dominate this space and, and be very valuable players in moving the story forward. All right, just a few things to wrap this up because I, I, I really look forward to having questions and talking with you. Um, we're at an inflection point. You know, if I just go back to that initial slide where we showed these measures of scientific progress as they were mapped to different parts of the value chain. Knowledge is cr being created. The state of the science around autism is maturing at a rapid pace. It's as mature in the world of psychiatry as any other field I've worked in. In fact, because of the strength of genomic uh, findings in the space is probably more tractable from a therapeutic area than some of these areas like Alzheimer's and schizophrenia are. So the time is right. It's almost as if a critical mass is formed on the knowledge side. It's just a matter of figuring out how do we get more investment from the for-profit world into this space and how we tighten up uh, the, the, the engine of evidence creation in clinical trials. I will just repeat what you already know. The future of treatment in autism is going to be multimodal. And there will be no, no abandonment of behavioral interventions. That will continue to be the workhorse for changing outcome. But therapeutic interventions from medicines to technology are going to make these more potent, going to make these more valuable. It's going to be, I think, a really exciting time to see these other therapeutic modalities begin to mature. Heterogeneity, heterogeneity, if there's one thing you take home today, if, if, if we as a field, from funders to companies, investment groups, to researchers writing your next grant, 
aren't anchoring yourself to the process of finding ways to reduce complexity in this population. We're all part of sort of burying ourselves in, in the, the struggles to move stories forward. All eyes are on these trials. There will be very intense media coverage of this later this year, but you will have heard it now. These are studies that really have the potential to define how medicine's development will be done for years. If these read out positive, these will lay out a precedent in a construct. And if they're positive, I can guarantee you every other company in the world will be asking, where is our vasopressin one antagonist and how do we play catch up with this industry, with this company? I will wrap up by emphasizing something I said earlier, and this is for the parents in the room. Your role in this process is about to change to a far more active state. I really do believe that there will be an expansion of the digital interface between the research community and the patient community. They're enabled through the same things we use to keep, keep in touch with friends. Because the continuous collection of data within that in an individual manner is telling us more about whether or not treatments are working or what's happening in your lives than just single data points that are collected every few weeks. Both of them can serve the purpose. I'm not devaluing either. But I can guarantee you this will be a very exciting time here in the future in that particular area. And it will bring parents into and caregivers around individuals in a far more active role. And I, it will be exciting to see this. I appreciate you speaking to the end game being really truly what the end game is um, from a human potential perspective. Yeah. And I can't uh, emphasize enough the truth in the frustration of parents, myself included, on wanting more options for therapeutic engagement, particularly now in this adolescent phase, um, when other families that I speak with feel equally frustrated that it's hard to figure out what we're, what we're supposed to do mm. and how we can be of help beyond just social skills groups. A question for you today is neurofeedback. Um, my most recent um, venture is looking into neurofeedback. It was recommended uh, by a therapist to help with my son's anxiety. Um, I know it can be controversial, but as a parent who spent a lot of time and money on options to help my son. Um, wondered if you could speak to that. Well, I'm not a clinician and I'm not an expert in that area. So I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot to, to offer on that question. I, I know that's probably gonna be a dissatisfying uh, <laughs> answer to that. Um, I will say there's no shortage of controversial treatments out, out in the community. And I empathize with families as whether or not you're on a new diagnosis or you've been on the journey for many years. And it's not easy to wade through a unrefereed, completely unkept body of content available to anyone on the internet. And uh, it doesn't matter whether or not you're talking about autism, anybody now can go and be misguided and misdirected. And, there's a lot of work for uh, patient groups, but I, I do think researchers and clinicians need to own this too. It's a lot of work to be done to provide better resources that offer, don't offer indictments of new treatments, experimental treatments, but offer a, an objective standardized assessment of how they compare to other things based on a, a body of criteria. And that doesn't exist for, for most everything out there. And we wrestled at Autism Speaks with how to uh, handle the app space. Yes. One of the most common questions I would get when I meet with parents is, what app should my child be using? They're, you know, they spend hours on this, you know, and what's good, what's not? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, to be honest, this is one of those areas where there, there really isn't clinical trial work behind most. I mean, handhold adaptive do, doing work in this area. There are companies that are striving to produce evidence, but we work to try to create some criteria that we could at least compare 
apples and oranges together and gave parents the, the, you know, these resources online. This needs to be done across the spectrum of modalities out there. Um, not make decisions for parents, but at least right. enable them. And just to take that a step forward, educating parents about what that value chain is. What, what is, what, do you, what should you demand in terms of information to I increase the confidence that what you're investing in terms of your child's time and exposure to you know, safe, safety issues is, is worth it. There's nothing worse than the opportunity cost of lost time spent on something that's not working. You're not gonna get that time back. So a lot of work to be done in that area. Call it. Fantastic, that was a fantastic uh, overview and uh, drilling down to, to various key points. I wanna point out that um, you know, not only is there a heterogeneity across individuals, but there may be some subgroups of the autisms where there's, you know, more than one genetic hit or an additive effect. And, you know, people have been focused on, a, you know, a single drug or multimodality in the sense of a drug and say a behavioral or an, a, an academic intervention. But I think you know what we see clinically is it often takes a combination of medications, oftentimes hitting all these ancillary problems uh, before you can get uh, maybe a synergistic effect to have real benefit. And the problem is it's almost impossible to get funding to look at you know, dual or more interventions, whether it's two medications or an educational intervention. Any thoughts or ideas you have about um, who would be interested in, in funding such a thing? Well, this is a, uh, it doesn't stop there. You know, just imagine how do you operationalize a discovery program to build those functionalities into a molecule? So, beyond the art of medicine that you practice, which is experimenting with classes and dose to find the right personalized combination for that individual, which is, I think, the art of medicine. It's gonna be very difficult at times to sort of implement that into the form of a clinical trial in some cases, but we know from existing therapeutically active drugs that most of them are working because they hit multiple targets rather than a single target like they, most drugs will claim they do. How do you implement a screening strategy that builds in multiple functionalities into the drug? It's gonna be very difficult. It's gonna be very difficult to fund that. I think beyond trying the more complicated, which this is probably a necessary complexity that we will have to travel, we need some early wins. Mm -hmm. The field right now needs wind in the sails. There's a lot of enthusiasm for the opportunity landscape that using science from large companies to help people offers in the autism community, but there's a lot of intolerance to risk. And there's a financial landscape around the models of pharmaceutical companies that have made that increasingly hard. So they want to be convinced. And going for the more simple routes, even though they may not help the entire population, helping one subgroup, just one win right now, could change everything. And will, I think, in time, create a greater tolerance and broader bandwidth for funding the more complicated paths forward. It's just we have to get that momentum going. That's why I think there's so much pressure on these two trials in some way, because they do have offer the opportunity to really create a level of excitement, a level of de-risking for investors around this that, that isn't there today. I'm a retired, 86 years old, and what I've listened to you say certainly applies to the other end of the life cycle. Old people, you talked about inclusion, helping, uh, a year ago, I moved into an assisted living community in Folsom. And uh, it's so important to, to help one another to understand and encourage. People get discouraged. They can't think straight. They forget things. Mm. 
And uh, I look at the children here raising their hands, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to think about. And uh, what you're saying will apply right till the end of our lives. Agreed. I, I think that, that dimension of the autism target landscape has been inadequately represented in how we think about therapeutics development. It is, you know, our, you know, there are a number of reasons why I've claimed drug companies aren't engaging. One of them has to do with the presumption, the unchallenged assumption, really, that this is a pediatric disorder. And of course, they get scared away from the complexities of trying to conduct pediatric clinical trials and, and all that comes with it, when, all, when in reality, there's an entire lifespan of unmet need. And, and there com there's complexity about whether or not the druggable biology that we must engage to help is available equally across that lifespan, or is it available only, is one target only available in certain windows of time? There's much we need to know, and the area of life, the, the topic of lifespan is, is really a critical area we need to know more about. Couldn't agree with you more. Hi, my name's Miria, and I'm working as an early interventionist, so I'm on the behavioral side of autism intervention. Sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> but uh, my question is, I noticed that like, so much of the research is focused on pharmacological uh, response or answers to autism. And coming from a behavior side, I'm just curious how much of the funding is going into research on the other modalities that you mentioned? Well, you know, just to be upfront, I, of course, gave you a biased talk, right? I, you know, I, I, my expertise is in medicines development, and maybe I wasn't as upfront early on that it would be more biased to that without at all inferring that the other modalities aren't relevant, aren't important, do not carry eff efficacy or potency with what they're attempting to do. The clinical trial data does speak some, say some important things. For the gold standard, for, for behavioral interventions to be the front line of autism, standard of care, that should be 10 times more clinical trials going on than medicines trials. They're not. And, you know, and, 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 and that's not just about trying to grab birds that are in your hand. It also, I, I might be her heretical here, but you know, it also reveals that I don't think we know enough about inter behavioral interventions. We don't know enough about dose. Even some of the most widely used interventions don't have the level of evidence behind them that drugs that get approved on the market at a minimum need to have to get past phase two. And that's not to say that these don't work. But behavioral interventions, I think, need to catch up in the clinical trial area in the same dimensions that medicines and technologies and others have to maintain. It's all equal. You know, it doesn't matter if you're looking at behavioral intervention or you're looking at a technology. They have to cross the same bar. You have to prove that it works. There are, I think behavioral interventions have some added complexities to it that medicines don't. Oh, yeah, drug companies have to ensure that the, the, the Chemicals in the drugs are being made the same way every day, and the, the you know the uh, um, the supply chain is secure and safe. And every, you know when someone takes a pill, they're going to get what they're getting every day. There's an entire industry around that that doesn't exist in behavioral interventions. And 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 even in some of these emerging areas like you know apps and other areas, it doesn't exist. So. The cons you know, the, how things are being generalized and how they're being d disseminated, you know, needs to have, you know, there needs to be a closer look at that. But I, I do think you're raising an important point. That should be, there should be a lot more clinical trials as powered as these medicines trials are in the behavioral interventions area. So. I have a five-year-old uh, diagnosed with um, ADHD and PDD, NOS, and SPD, and some other stuff on his Rx. <laughs> Um, we have 20 hours of ABA a week. My question to you is when you were talking about modalities and, for instance, Facebook and, and talking to other parents and streaming information, you couldn't be more spot on. I talked to ladies from Zimbabwe, Cambodia, and we all have, it's weird, but we all have the same but different. 
And I was wondering, um, is, are you guys tracking that in any way? Are you making some sort of, um, I guess, data or a I anything? Left, yeah, because left it is so too. strange. Yeah. Wow. It's, I'm telling you, this is the future. Because I think because of the way we are digitally enabled, because of the same tools that have emerged to help drive commercial content to you, you mm -hmm. search for one product on Google, before you know it, all you're getting is ads for that, you know, it penetrates everybody. The same tools that are used to understand what you're wanting, mm -hmm. needing, talking about, can be leveraged to help self-organize conversations around issues that have a different valence, a different meaning. And if you had an underlying layer of biology attached to that, a genome, a genotype, what else could you know about those self-organized conversations? There was a very interesting um, trial done with 23andMe, you know, the commercial genotype, that you, get your, you get your genome sequenced, or, or I don't know if it's exome, or, but they recognize, look, we have 140 something thousand people who self-identify as having had depression at one point in their life. And we got all the, they have all the genetic information on them, and they've got, they realize they have 350 something thousand people who don't have depression. And they worked with investigators at Columbia and asked, is there anything genetically different at a population scale? So trade off specificity and control for scale. And they found some very interesting findings. I'm not sure, you know, have to look a little sideways, but this is, I think, a very valuable sort of insight into the way it could happen. And again, you start to ask questions that I raised. Ethically, are we okay with that? You know, you know, is this legally? You know, they're going to. These questions are going to, you know, define whether or not we realize that future. There was even a. I have to bring this one. It's a very interesting example of researchers at Microsoft who are taking on the problem of pancreatic cancer, worst cancer you can get, horrible prognosis. Uh, and what they did, and there's nothing available to diagnosis before it's usually too late. So game's on to try to find early factors that predict this. And what they decided to do is say, look, okay, what if we went out and found individuals who, based on the search criteria in a search engine online, have evidence of what we think they just got a diagnosis with pancreatic cancer, and then follow up and, and verify that, yeah, they got they definitely had the diagnosis. And then they asked the question, what were they searching for six months before that? Was there anything a priori that might have revealed something about their un underlying biology simply because of their media appetite, what they were looking for and not knowing that? And they found several factors that statistically, cool, I mean, they, they like, again, yeah, hard to really buy into that, but is that really a completely crazy idea? I don't think so. You know, and I, I, I think, though, regardless of how this plays out, and trust me, this is gonna play out, it has to be guided by clinicians, by researchers, by parents, the same sort of organizing principles, understanding what you're looking for, what it is, has to be in play or it won't have any value. And so this is what we're seeing now, the early matchmaking between disciplines that always precede a revolution in thought about that. And I, I really do think it's what we've you know, experienced on the social side that's going to pay out in these other areas. So, so I'm gonna respond. Yep. Respond to two questions, okay. and then I'm going to ask a question. Okay. So we're actually right now using Skype uh, to deliver uh, language interventions into the home, and other people are developing that too. So it's incredibly doable, and it reduces the burden on families. It's just we have to think differently about how we do interventions. Rather than us always being the clinicians that deliver, we have to train parents how to do it. And so that's, we're doing that now, and I think that's a really important way. It's also very cost effective. I think the other, th the other issue with you know, not having behavioral interventions kind of as frequent, I think partly it's because, um, you know, we talk about the cost because it, it kind of, be, drugs kind of begin in private industry and so we're having better tracking of cost. Behavioral interventions are incredibly costly to develop as well and I think yeah. that we're a little bit behind there. 
but we're funded right now to do multimodal interventions where we're combining behavioral interventions delivered into the home through Skype with drugs. And so, I'm, and that's being funded by the NIH. And so, I think that the this landscape is where it's happening, right? Is here. really starting to change. And so, here, but here's my, my question it has to do with the heterogeneity. I mean, certainly, we need more basic science to understand the heterogeneity, but do you think that we should be thinking about treatment trials as a way of also parsing the heterogeneity? I mean, oftentimes when we do these treatment studies, we, we always accept that, well, we had responders and non-responders, but that's the end of our story, and we don't use it to generate hypotheses about why. And so I'm just interested in your notion about how we should rethink treatment as, a as giving us insight into mechanism. So absolutely, why not take full advantage of a clinical trial to capture as much information as you can about the individuals in it without compromising the bottom line of the trial? That is to get and answer the question. And I think too often we overstep and bake way too much into a trial and create complexity that allows you, misses the point of it. So I think there's a right balance, and that's the only way we're gonna move the autism story forward, certainly on outcome measures, is to trial and, you know, just trial and error. Uh, but this really is more to the funders who might be on the other end of that video, is this has to be funded. You know, the, 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 prior, the primary goal of the clinical trial is to test the question and to advance the story there. But it is a, 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 a um, huge missed opportunity not to take full advantage of that trial to collect other information that may very well advance um, stories that may help the next stage. I was telling the story of our first investment earlier today through our venture arm at Autism Speaks. First investment we made was in Seaside Therapeutics. We invested $2 million into a biomarkers program for their Arbaclofen trial. Got a lot of crap for that. And really, the, 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 a lot of the driving force behind that was an assumption that there was a high probability that that trial would fail. Just because of where we're at in the story, you know that it's a risk, but it's a risk we've got to take. And so, we knew that the, you have to play for the next trial. And the only way a company like that will be able to do the next trial is to convince whoever their sponsor is that you've learned enough from that trial to define the next one. So there are gonna be responders in every trial, usually. Can we understand those so that they're enrolled into the next one? And that's what we were investing. We weren't investing in another biomarkers program and everybody got bored, but no. We were making a strategic play along the lines you're saying. So funders need to understand it's not really just about advancing the science, you're advancing the momentum of the field by investing in the collection of additional data, absolutely. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.